very international. Um, we can turn to Judges chapter 2. I uh, just wanted to have a little bit of a look today about, about man's ways versus God's ways and, and justice and um, the, the mess that mankind gets themselves in when they try and use wisdom, their own wisdom, to make this world run in a smooth way. Um, it seems like the more sophisticated mankind gets, um, that the more illogical things seem and um, the more convoluted things seem to get in this world. Um, and that basic logic sort of goes out the window and uh, we're in very knotted up logic and things like that. And, you know, I was thinking particularly with this talk about about even areas where we would think that you could not get confused or you could not get um, tangled up in areas like law, you know, law is supposed to be the foundation of our society. And yet, when you look at the, the courts and, and um, the things that go on around law, um, it's probably cor as corrupt as anything else in society and certainly um, not consistent, not stable. Um, it's not a not an area, you know, ma mankind's idea of law is not an area you can rely on. It's not something that's consistent and stable. And um, thinking about how the, the legal system, I uh, don't particularly know what it's like in other countries, but there's definitely a hierarchy here with, with the, the local governments to the city level and then the county and then the state and then federal and how um, these court cases and things will, will uh, sort of rise and float up through the justice system and continually be flipping and flopping and um, reinterpreted and different opinions and different interpretation of the law will cause different outcomes in law. And, um, and so this is what mankind system brings us is it's confusion and instability. And um, so we're going to start in judges here. Um, and, you know, we, we read obviously in, in the books of the Old Testament about how um, Israel turning against laws, God's laws and commands um, definitely brought about negative results. It brought about defeats. Um, it brought about misery and worship of idols. Um, and so, uh, well, let's just read in Judges chapter two and verse, Six, And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant, uh, the servant of the Lord, died being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Heres, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel, probably a neglectful thing uh, on that generation, you know, not passing down the ways of the Lord and the things that he'd, he'd done. For Israel and verse 11 and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam um, and so it doesn't take long in when you're talking about mankind it doesn't take long for for people to forget and to for people to forget a righteous way and for generations to suffer decay in terms of you know whether they're on the Lord's side or fading out and drifting away from the tried and true ways of the Lord. And um, 
I don't know if if um, this world goes through cycles of, you know, basically decaying to civil disorder and, and societal unrest and all those things, and then maybe it resets a bit as, as things get so bad. But, um, you know, we're certainly finding ourselves at a, a time in this day and age of, of definite civil decay. And, um, you know, I always wonder how bad is it compared to how bad it could be? You know, you never know um, how long the Lord's going to wait and um, just how bad we're in. I mean, you read in the in the Bible, and you, you can certainly read that things were very bad at various stages. But um, yes, certainly, I think we see in this day and age the the uh, the decay at the in the institutions that are the main parts of society that have um, departed from the ways of the Lord, we could certainly say it's, it's pretty bad times. And, and uh, if you just turn along to verse 15, same chapter. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it repented the Lord because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they returned and corrupted themselves more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. They ceased not from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, because that this people has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that though them, sorry, that through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein, as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. And, um, you know, the... It says there in verse 17 and 18 that the Lord installed judges and it says if you if you look at what those judges did um, you know it talks about that the judge if they followed them that they would deliver them out of the hands of their enemies so it wasn't particularly maybe a, a judge that we think of in our courts of law it was probably more of a a, 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 a leader that set um, the standards and, and maybe even a military leader because it talks to them about, you know, delivering out of enemies and things. And um, so it seems like maybe in, in, in the context, you know, the judge is something that says they're the Lord installed and they were sort of purely focused on getting the people to, uh, to be righteous, to follow the righteous way of the Lord. And it says there that when they departed and they went their stubborn way, that um, the Lord was not there to deliver them from their enemies. And, you know, um, we, we won't turn to it, but in Judges chapter 17, it's that famous saying that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So in these times, again, decay happened. We were in a good generation with Joshua following the ways of the Lord, and then it just took one generation before things started to to fade. And then soon, soon you had a society that was just like figuring out in their own head what is right, and then following that. And we know that um, that cannot be good. Uh, let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel chapter 7.
you know, you hear about the the story of our particular fellowship in the, and where it's come from and over the last whatever it is, nearly 100 years. And um, the one thing that when you hear, I think there's some YouTube um, documentaries about just the, the history of the fellowship and um, the journey and what's happened and things like that. And the one thing that you you take from it is that we just w always want to be humble and look to the Lord that um, that each generation continues to to follow the right way and not to head off in some radical direction. And this is the times we're talking about here, very much representative of that, you know, the, the generations that risk departing from the Lord. And, and we're reading here in 1 Samuel 7, probably forward a few hundred years from the passage in Judges there. And um, I said 1 Samuel 7, right? So we'll just read the end of this chapter before going into the next one. Um, cause it says that, um, again, similar to the, the days of Joshua in verse 15, and Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpeh, or Mizpeh and judged Israel and all those places. And his return was to Ramah for there was his house and there he judged Israel and there he built an altar to the Lord. And chapter eight um, and it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel and the name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second Abiah they were judges in Beersheba um, actually I meant to read verse 14 of the previous chapter where it just says that there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. And that's, that was the time when Samuel was growing old and uh, doing the judicial circuit there. And um, so it was a time of peace there. And thinking about how um, it is often times of peace on earth and times of um, plenty when mankind starts to dream up ideas and starts to get crazy with its ideas. Um, fortunately, it's not a good human trait that in times of desperation, we might be more willing to turn to God. Um, but when things are good, you know, we start to try and figure out, well, what can we, what can we make even better by our own wisdom? And so back to chapter eight and verse um, three, and his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside after Luca and took bribes and perverted judgment. So again, we're into decay. In verse four, then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, behold, thou art old and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me, and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, how be it yet protest solemnly unto them and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. And Samuel told all the words of the Lord unto the people that asked of him a king. And he said, this will be the manner of the king that shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for himself, for his chariots and to be his horsemen. And some shall run before his chariots and he will appoint him captains. And I won't read all the things, but you know, he goes on and says, like, you really want a king? This is what's, this is what a king is going to get you. And it just basically talks about the indulgence of the, what a king will do and to use the, use the people and abuse them and tax them and um, just basically do things pleasing unto himself. 
and um, and let's skip down to verse 18. It says, and you shall cry out in that day because of your king, which you shall have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Um, and Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, hearken unto their voice and make them a king. And Samuel said unto the men of Israel, go you every man, man in, unto his city. And so, you know, even with the, the explicit warning of what a king is going to do, they didn't back down. They didn't consider it. They didn't want to think about it. And um, it says there that they wanted to be like the other nations you know for what reason did they actually think about this why did they want to be like other nations you know is it covetousness is it um they liked the idea of a that king figure you know as i said before when we're talking about judges i think there is a difference between the judges that the lord installed and and the idea of a king um it seemed like the judge was a more, much more practical figure with less of the authority and ability to, to abuse and the people and more of a direct calling to steer the people, the children of Israel in the right way and to, to, to be, you know, to lead and conquer and the victories and the wars that they had to get the people um, aligned, looking to the, to the Lord God and the people wanted more than that in, in the end of course they just want they wanted less of god and more of a figure of man or a leader of man and obviously when you think about um how the kings of, of israel worked out um there was a lot more bad ones than good ones and you know, as I said, they were warned in advance. No, I guess it just fell on deaf ears. I don't even think they probably processed it. And it's a lesson to us to be, when we're rushing into things, just stop, pause, and actually think about what we're doing. Is it a good idea? How does it line up against God's wisdom? Um, let's turn to Second Chronicles chapter 25. <clears throat> Second Chronicles chapter 25. Um, try and keep this passage brief, but it is there's a lot in here and it's it's good, but I just want to pick out the points. It's about Amaziah, king of Judah. Um, and well in verse 1 of 2 Chronicles chapter 25, it says, Amaziah was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. Um, and so as we read through, and I try and skim through this chapter, just think about, the crazy things that go on, the, the flipping and the flopping and the lack of direction and the lack of stability that this king exhibits and, and where it ends up. And uh, maybe if we read in verse, you know, it says in verse five that he um, basically appointed captains and thousands of, over thousands of people and, you know, throughout Judah and then in verse six, it says he hired also a hundred thousand mighty men of valor out of Israel, the other kingdom, for for an hundred talents of silver. So he's basically paying them to join him. And verse seven, but there came a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel, to wit, with all the children of Ephraim. So it's 
some prophet here um, warning the king that this is not a good idea. And verse eight, but it, if thou will go, do it, be strong for the battle, God shall make thee fall before the enemy, for God has power to help and to cast down. And Amaziah said to the man of God, but what shall we do for the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel? And the man of God answered, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. So he's saying like, you know, what am I, I've paid these guys to join me. What are we going to do about that? You know, um, wasted money. And the response is that basically that's the least of your problems. If, if you're worried about money, the Lord being alive, switching and switching to be the Lord is going to bring you a whole lot more than what you've lost. Um, in verse 10, then Amaziah separated them to wit the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again. Wherefore their anger was greatly kindled against Judah and they returned home in great anger. So they got, they got sent home. Um, and Amaziah strengthened himself and led forth his people and went to the valley of salt and smote of the children of Seir 10,000. Uh, I don't know. It's hard to pick up. Like, did he just get angry and go and just start another war and just take out his bloodlust on some other group of people? I don't know, but certainly seems that way. Uh, <clears throat> um, anyway, so verse 12 and other 10,000 left alive did the children of Judah carry away captive and brought them unto the top of the rock and cast them down from the top of the rock that they were that all were broken in pieces. But the soldiers of the army, which Amaziah sent back, that they should not go with them him to battle, fell upon the cities of Judah from Samaria even to, unto Beth Horon and smote 3,000 of them and took much spoil. Now it came to pass after that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites that he brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his gods and bowed them bowed down himself before them and burned incense unto them. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah and he sent unto him a prophet, which said unto him, why has thou sought after the gods of the people, which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? And it came to pass as he talked with him that the king said unto him, art thou made of the king's counsel forbear? Why shouldest thou be smitten? Then the prophet forbear and said, I know that God has determined to destroy thee because thou hast done this and has not hearkened unto my counsel. Um, and so, you know, the prophet there brings up a great point in verse 15. You know, why would you set up um, the gods, the idols of the people that you just defeated? the idols that couldn't help them that were powerless and you're bringing their gods into you into worship it's crazy and so um you know there, there's a lot in this story um it's probably a talk in itself but basically you read in this chapter and it still goes on about the indecisiveness of amaziah and the lack of doing it god's way from the start um you know, all these kinds of things. It's a very fickle thinking, and it's the it's the way of mankind to this day is to try and figure it out as you go along, to make it up as you go along, thinking you have wisdom and thinking that, you know, you can figure out a, a good way to go. And if only we go God's way from the start, then... Uh, things will be much better. How many times have you heard um, people that get spirit filled and saved and in their testimony, they say they wish, you know, they wish they had found the Lord or they must, or they would have humbled themselves sooner and they would have avoided a whole lot of trouble in their life. <clears throat> and um, I've heard that a lot. It's, it's something that actually uh, helps people grow up in the Lord too. Cause you know, sort of like, you don't have that big amazing conversion but then you think well the people that had that wish they didn't <laughs> they wish that they knew the Lord their whole life so 
there's something to that. But um, let's turn to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. So another passage here about um, wanting to look at Pilate and the example, sort of a similar line here about, about the way mankind judges, about the way mankind runs things, about his logic and how it's just, um, like I said, very fickle, very um, unstable, if you like. And... Um, Again, I'll try not to read the whole chapter, but um, so Luke chapter 23 and verse one, and the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him. And of course, Jesus, we're talking about here, trials of Jesus. And they began to accuse him saying, we found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered them, him and said, Thou sayest it. And then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. And when, <clears throat> and when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him, and Herod with his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together for before they were at enmity between themselves. And that's a striking verse there, thinking about, you know, this, these trials of the most righteous man on earth, the most perfect man on earth, that it would actually be so wrong that two enemies, two leaders that are enemies, uh, would become friends together. Um, this is the corruption of, of mankind and the craziness, I guess. There's some stuff in this passage, as is in other ones I've read, where it's just sort of like, it's insane, it's crazy. What things happen when mankind just follows, follows his nose almost, you know, just following his own wisdom. And um, verse 13, and Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people said unto them, you have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I have examined him before you and found no fault in this man touching those things whereof you, you accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent him you to him and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. Um, for of necessity, you must release one unto them at the feast. So, you know, saying he, he's, he's innocent, I can't find any fault, but I'll, I'll give him a good um, punishment to, to, uh, to please, to placate the crowd that was baying for his blood. And um, you know, what is that? What kind of justice is that? Uh, he's innocent, but, but we'll punish him halfway, you know, um, verse 18. And they cried out all at once saying away with this man and release unto us Barabbas, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. Pilate, therefore willing to release Jesus spake again to them, but they cried saying, crucify him, crucify him. And he said unto them the third time, why, what evil has he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. 
and they were instant with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified, and the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed, and Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required, and he released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Um, and, you know, showing here the constant um, pressure of the people, uh, the people that wanted Jesus crucified. Um, and the fact that I think the, some of these trials or this trial was even um, maybe in the other gospels that <laughs> talked about the time. I think they, they had the trial at night, which I don't think was, was allowed under the law. So there was all sorts of um, illegal things going on in the supposed foundation of society in the trials and courts, the leaders of the day. It just like today, um, the corruption that maybe passes as okay, maybe, uh, you know, in this society, um, if the outcome is what you think is just, then it doesn't matter what, what things were done wrong to get to that place. Um, you know, it's every, everyone, what they see as right in their own eyes. And so, this is the world we live in, where um, there is no reliance on God, there's no stability, because we are not all following God, but praise the Lord, you know, some of us are, we've been filled with the Holy Spirit, we'll check it, read about that in a second. Um, but yes, uh, so many things skirted here, um, and these passages show us as it just guides us through what happened, how there was not, no one was looking to God. No one was trying to see what was the right thing to be done, but it's, it's all mankind looking at mankind and figuring it out as they go along. And I was thinking about um, the, the, as I sort of mentioned before about the, the courts and the justice system of today and the, flip-flopping as things go around the courts and the circuits. Um, I was looking up in the uh, Supreme Court decisions. You can sort of see what by by year they select a whole bunch of court uh, cases, of course, and they turn down others. And um, you can see how many they reversed. And if you look, I looked at just the last two or three years and you know in 2022 it was 70 percent of cases they overturned so you know when i talk about there's a case at a lower level and then it's appealed and it's overturned and then it's appealed again and it's sort of some of these cases go a long time and it ends up it ends up just whatever the supreme court says you know, the last flip flop is the one that wins kind of thing. It's, it's kind of weird. Um, but yeah, 70%. So more than half, actually three years ago, it was 82% of the Supreme Court's cases were reversed. And then you, it shows by um, the circuits, the areas of the United States, also the percentage. And there's, there's five or six that all the court cases from that circuit that came to the Supreme Court were reversed. And so what, what kind of, you know, what kind of foundation do we have in society without commenting on whether they're right or wrong, you know, clearly something's wrong because it's just chaos. And, um, and this is what happens when you have mankind. I was also thinking about a court case, uh, it's a podcast that I'd heard. And, uh, I think it was a guy that was falsely charged with murder and he, um, his, his case got appealed and won and then retried like six or seven times, like the same crime tried six or seven times, like, and the, the, the jury would find him guilty and then it'd be appealed and it'd be like, well, there's, there was no justice here, send it back to the court and they do another case. And it, this happened so many times and it, it's just crazy. Um, it was a crazy story. All right, let's um, let's turn to Second Corinthians chapter one.
So the things that we find in, in this day and age are instability, you know, lack of clarity of the law, lack of interpretation. I mean, you can have a clear law, but if you're not interpreting it clearly and consistently, then it gives rise to civil unrest. And, and maybe we're seeing a lot of that lately in the last few years um, where, you know, there's not, if, if, um, if we're not aligned with God, if we're not doing things God's way and we're wavering, and we're trying to appease everyone, no one's happy and you get a very unstable society and um you know there's th there's a way that they try and do the law you know there's things um there's different laws in different states and i, I find it interesting how the usa is probably more originally designed to be like a group of 50 countries versus one country and you know, I think it was originally designed where each state would essentially um, set its course as far as what's law. And, um, and even there are things that um, they've done to make it so that things don't get really crazy. If you think about the counties in a state, um, there are situations that have to be avoided where, um, you know, that if you're going for a drive to the grocery store, that um, if you happen to cross a county line, you don't su suddenly become a felon because of something you're doing that is different in a neighboring county. And this is the kinds of things that they try and resolve at the state level. You think about you know, weapons, laws and things like that, where you could very easily um, cross a border and suddenly you go from a law abiding citizen to someone who's breaking the law and in danger of being in trouble. Um, traffic laws as well. There's a sort of a standard that a state tries to get where it's like, so that the citizens aren't going to be in mass confusion, driving around in a state of cor um, being correct and then being you know, out of whack with the law. And really what it comes down to is as spirit filled Christians, you know, the great thing about being spirit filled is we all have the same truth, the same source of truth in us. And actually, I know we didn't read it, but we'll just turn to Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter one. And so we, you know, we read just before Jesus crucified and he of course rose on the third day and miraculously, um, there was a period of time after he rose again where he essentially was preparing his followers for a way that they guess would be transitioned from the old testament the old ways through the law to actually having a the holy spirit placed inside of them where they could um have a way to follow at a personal level a personal relationship with god and you know Jesus said in Acts chapter one, verse eight, said that, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witness unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And then he, he was taken away. And, uh, and he also said in verse five, you know, you'll be, you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Of course, they didn't really know what was going to happen. But uh, Jesus told them to wait. And in verse one of Acts chapter two, it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues as, like as of fire and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. And so this experience of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit was first occurred here. And what it did for us is that it gave us access to the Holy Spirit, the same source of truth that um, we aren't called to, um, we aren't called to make this world better in, in the natural sense. We are called to preach the gospel and make lives better through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
and um, you know, Peter stood up and talked after this point of time, and you know, it's basically said, told them how it, how it was and what this what this all meant and the momentous occasion that it was. Um, verse seven. Uh, 16 but this is that which was spoken by the prophet joel in the old testament the prophecy that shall come to pass in the last days saith god i will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions your old male sh men shall dream dreams um, and on my servants and on my handmaidens i will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy and uh just want to read verse 21 and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved so this experience was open to all all mankind it wasn't just the jews it wasn't the children of israel it wasn't the descendants but all mankind in this gospel would go throughout the earth as we've seen it happen um and Um, verse 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it and so mentions there about the injustice that jesus suffered in the way that he was crucified and uh, we can't say that we wouldn't be one of those people um against jesus if we were alive in those days and so that's why we we uh, certainly have humility and and thankfulness that the lord has saw fit to call us um and to fill us with the holy spirit and given us that common truth and a way where we don't have to rely on some way of mankind to get through this life and it's a very peaceful thing it's a very assuring thing to have the holy spirit to be able to pray in the holy spirit to be able to have god build you up to follow his word and everything's just works there isn't a there isn't a a um a thing a situation a trial a tribulation in our life that we have to wonder about how to handle it's all laid out for us. And um, I guess if there's any point of this talk, it's that, is that we don't have to be like these kings, these judges, these um, leaders um, that we've read about that have to make it up as they go along that for some reason want to turn away the righteousness of the Lord and walk in their own ways. Um, don't turn to it, but in J James chapter 1, it talks about, how God that with God there's no variableness or shadow of turning and so having been given a great way to walk it also doesn't change it's steadfast and the seasons change and this world changes but God's way always will get us through um try and wrap it up here now um Maybe we'll just finish in uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spares not his own son but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So he's saying if, if God gave his only son for us, you know, everything else is, is in, in essence of, of lesser consequence than that. So he is going to take care of us. He's already shown how far he's going to go for us. And so now let's realize he has our lives in his hand. Um, Verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. 
Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Um, and it goes through and about all the things that are not going to take us away from the Lord. And um, that's the that's the really the last challenge that we have left on this earth is to realize that all these things that it talks about tribulation, distress, famine, peril, and all these kinds of things, that that doesn't mean that God has forsaken us or that we should look to another way or try something else out or mix, you know, like um, Isaiah there, like mixing a little bit of following God's ways with a little bit of your own ideas. Because as soon as you, you do that, you've leavened the Lord's word and you know, you're now in a completely different um, mode, if you like. As soon as you mix the Lord's ways with something else, something foreign, it's no longer the Lord's ways. And so let's, um, let's just remember these things, that if we stick to the Lord's ways, it's going to work. It's all going to work out. We'll be raised to meet him in the air. Um, we'll have assurance. We'll have stability. We'll know what his plan is for us. Um, we're all looking in the same direction. We know the same end and we'll just leave it there.